Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure today to welcome uh, Dr. David Zitmorski, Z sorry, Zitmorski, who's currently a postdoctoral researcher in the Energy Materials and Devices Laboratory of Professor Jay Grossman at MIT as a WIND seminar speaker today. David obtained his BN degree in uh, Electrical and Biomedical Engineering at McMaster University in 2010, and uh, he won the Canadian Governor General's Medal for the highest academic achievement in, uh, 19, 19, in 2006, and the Provost Honor Roll Medal in 2007. So he was, you know, won some good prizes for his work as an undergraduate. He did his PhD at the University of Toronto in electrical and computer engineering with Professor Ted Sargent uh, on nanocrystals and optoelectronic semiconductor device fabrication and investigation. <coughs> and David held uh, both NSERC and OGS scholarships uh, during that PhD uh, and won an NSERC Alexander Graham Bell graduate scholarship in 2011. Uh, uh, David has a broad research experience uh, on materials processing, particularly of colloidal, colloidal uh, quantum dots for optoelectronic device applications, on device fabrication techniques, on modeling of bulk uh, and nanomaterial optoelectronic device stacks, and materials characterization. He's published 20 peer-reviewed journal papers, and his work has been cited over 1,000 times. And amongst the number of notable, notable achievements, uh, which I picked out as a paper in Nature Communications of 2014, describing a novel preservation scheme for colloidal quantum dots. And that, uh, those uh, colloidal quantum dots achieved a record 8.5% photovoltaic power uh, conversion efficiency. He also developed the first N-type material for high performance quantum dot photovoltaics. At MIT, uh, now as a banding, as an NSERC banding postdoctoral fellow, He's working on renewable energy with a major emphasis on materials design and fabrication of low-cost, high-efficiency devices. And of course, I think you all know this is a very hot area of research at the present time. So please give a warm welcome to David Zitomirsky for his talk, Surface Engineering of Colloidal Quantum Dots for Enhanced Optical -to Electronic Devices. David. All right. Uh, Thanks for coming to my talk, everybody. I'm uh, really excited to be here and, and to meet uh, your fa the faculty and students and to give this uh, seminar. So today I'll be talking to you about the surface engineering of colloidal quantum dots. If you don't know what those are, don't worry. By the end of this presentation, I'll have a very good idea. And how do we make something useful out of them? How do we take these materials and make devices uh, with them that can break current compromises in conventional bulk semiconductor devices? So let's start with an outline of what I'll talk about. So the first part of this presentation, I'll motivate the research that goes on with colloidal quantum dots from a perspective of uh, energy and how we can use these materials to harvest energy, uh, renewable energy and why it's better than conventional ways that we uh, make solar panels and also why we need nanotechnology to do this. Then I'll talk about colloidal quantum dots from a broad perspective as optoelectronic building blocks. They're not only good for making solar cells, they're good for making all sorts of different uh, devices, which include uh, light emitting uh, devices, photo detectors, and uh, photovoltaics. Then I'll move into the core part of my talk, and this is how we've been able to engineer certain properties in colloidal quantum dot materials uh, that allow us to build more advanced devices, that allow us to do interesting things spectroscopically. And finally, I'll sum up with some other avenues uh, where we could take quantum dots beyond the optoelectronic uh, device applications. So to start, and you may have seen many talks like this, where you, motivation is basically that we burn uh, too many fossil fuels and we use too much oil, natural gas, and coal for our energy needs, so, uh, the x-axis is here is the year. This is fairly recent, 2013 uh, data summarized. And you can see that renewables, they make a very small sliver of that. And so if we bor keep burning a lot of coal and fossil fuels, it'll uh, lead to pollution and climate change. And this is something we want to avoid. And it's actually becoming more and more of an issue every year. 
So here comes the sun, and the sun provides a huge amount of energy uh, to the Earth. So in just over one hour, it's enough energy coming down onto the Earth's surface to power the entire world for a year to meet our energy requirements. So to put it in another way, you can cover about half of Ontario with a 15% uh, efficient energy uh, harvesting scheme, and that'll be enough uh, to supply the world's energy for a year, uh, well, just through time. So how do we get uh, energy from the sun and convert it to something useful? So as you may know, the energy from the sun comes down in the form of photons. And it's not just one type of photon, it's an entire spectrum. And here's the solar spectrum seen here. So the, uh, the x-axis is wavelength, and the y-axis is the spectral irradiance, the power per meter squared uh, per nanometer. And as the solar radiation is coming through the Earth, it's getting absorbed by various uh, bands here. So the moisture and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, they prevent from all the power coming down. So this is what you're left with, this red spectrum. And that's where you can collect and convert into something useful. So then we can have an energy harvester that converts this, these photons into something uh, useful. And in some applications, you want to do that in the form of electricity. So your output is electricity. So a really hot way to do this is photovoltaics. And typically, in photovoltaics, the most successful scheme has been silicon solar cells for large, large area, large uh, power uh, plants for producing electricity. So the nice thing about uh, crystalline silicon solar cells is that they're efficient and they're scalable. And, but the downside is that they're expensive uh, from a materials processing point of view. And there's a lot of infrastructure requirements. Uh, so actually putting up the solar panels, they can be heavy. So you need extra infrastructure to put them in some places. So why, why nanotechnology? Um, so we want to come up with a new material that can sort of break some of those compromises on the previous slide. And we turn to nanotechnology because we know that in certain material systems, we can have a variety of different ways where we can engineer the chemistry uh, to generate different types of um, molecules or, or, or designs. So this is the carbon family. You also have access to quantum phenomena that you don't have available to you at the at the macro scale. So in colloidal quantum dots, this is a photograph of different vials of, of quantum dots. And the, there are nanoparticles suspended in solution. And they're being illuminated with an ultraviolet source. So they're excited. And then there is a relaxation process, which gives off a photon. And you can, by tuning the particle size, you can actually tune the electronic properties of the band gap. And that's why you end up with uh, this kind of optical response. So you have access to quantum phenomena. And finally, there's an opportunity for greatly reduced cost from the perspective of be having these materials being processed from solutions. And then you can put them on uh, flexible substrates, and you can make them lightweight for integration into, uh, say, in the case of solar cells buildings. So in, this is the second part of the talk where I tell you a little bit about quantum dots, what they are, and how do they relate to the conventional bulk semiconductor picture. So first, a definition. The optoelectronic devices are devices that employ, employ both photons and electrons to achieve a certain functionality. They require semiconductors. And often, the band engineering is critical for these devices to work. So in the case of bulk semiconductors, they often have a fixed band gap, but they can also be tuned in alloy semiconductors. So if you don't know what a semiconductor is, uh, materials such as semiconductors, they have, uh, because of their structure, they have a atoms and they have, those atoms have electrons. And when you put atoms together, you end up with this kind of um, energy distributions for where your electrons can sit in the material. So when you see band diagrams, typically the x the, you get an x-axis, this is the direction of the material, and then you have energy. And then you, you get what's called the band gap. So, so the band gap is comprised of a conduction band and the valence band. And in the valence band, you have, it's filled with electrons. So this is the energy levels they can occupy. Then there's a space where there's no energy levels that things can occupy. And then you have a conduction band. And as you'll see, this is an important concept for the rest of the talk. So there's some standard um, 
semiconductors that you might know, like silicon, it has a band gap, so the, the, the separation between its valence and conduction of 1.12 EV and germanium 0.66. And so you can, like I say, you can alloy them and get a range uh, of, of band gaps. And this is important because uh, silicon in particular, it's used in solar cells. So it has an absorption onset at, uh, at this energy, which is around also 1100 or 1200 nanometers. Uh, and so it will absorb the light uh, to the left of this wavelength. So then we sort of, this is the picture of bulk semiconductors. And now we move to the picture. Um, well, we talk a little bit about uh, the absorption process and then I'll tell you about quantum dots. So, in so when you absorb uh, photons, so this is kind of an analogy, you have the semiconductor which is a vacuum and it has a hose and these photons, um, only, a certain amount, only certain sizes would be able to fit in the hose. So these blue photons representing energetic, energetic photons, uh, the semiconductor would be able to absorb them. It might get some green ones, but it would not be able to absorb the red ones. So in this picture right here, you see that the, the, what, it, what ends up happening is that the photon is able to excite an electron from the valence band uh, to the conduction band and has to have sufficient energy to do that. So the blue one would be able to do it here, but the red one would not. And so if you look at the, what's called the absorption coefficient, you have all these different semiconductors, and some of them, uh, like silicon, uh, which is shown in red here, this curve, it has a, a steady absorption onset, while other ones have a very sharp one, and it's due to the nature of the semiconductor, whether it's direct or indirect. And so this is important because this absorption coefficient here, the inverse of it is sort of related to the length scale which you need to absorb most of the photons. And for silicon, if you want to make a, a solar cell out of silicon, if you want to absorb all of these photons here in the near infrared, you have to make really thick silicon slabs. And that's, a, that's an additional materials cost that you have to think about. So we sort of want something with, that is direct, that has a sharp absor absorption onset, and it has a high absorption uh, coefficient, so it could be made thin in a device. So what are quantum dots and how do quantum dots enable us to build better uh, photovoltaic devices? So again, I take this picture of the, uh, the energy diagram of a bulk semiconductor and this is, a, this is a plot of the energy and the density of states, say, of, in the conduction band. So as you go up in energy, uh, you have more density of states and they're continuous. That's a bulk semiconductor. Now if you take a slice of this semiconductor and you can find the dimensions on the nanoscale and you get a sheet, um, you end up with a discretization in the density of states with energy. And you can keep doing that into the 1D and 0D case and in the 0D case you end up having uh, the discrete levels rather than a continuous distribution. And so what a quantum dots energy uh, diagram looks like, basically what happens you take a material in the bulk and you make it really, really small on the nanoscale and what happens is the band gap uh, tends to increase and these states, both in the conduction band and in the valence band, they become discretized. And the reason this happens is something that's known as the Bohr exciton diameter and this excitation that you generate in the semiconductor, it's comprised of both uh, electron and a hole and, the, and these species they like to exist at a certain distance from each other and when you make the material so small that the distance that they like to be, uh, exist from one another they start feeling the, the, con the confines of the material you end up with this effect where you sort of increase the band gap and then you have this uh, discretization in the energy levels. So again, wh why would we want to do this? Um, well for one these materials can be made in solutions. So again, this is coming to the cost uh, aspect. So here's a, a batch of quantum dots I synthesized a couple weeks ago. And the way this is done, uh, you have this uh, round bottom flask and you, have, you do it under an uh, inert atmosphere. You have one precursor here uh, with very fine temperature control and you heat it up. So my precursor that I use is uh, 
a lead oxide, and then you inject a, surfer, a sulfur precursor, and these nanocrystals start to grow immediately before your eyes. And then when you go to do your TEM, you can see this is, a na this is the nanoparticle, and these are individual atoms, so you can image these uh, nanoparticles. And when you take absorption spectra of, the, of these materials, rather than have an onset and then continue up in absorption, so this is wavelength and this is the absorption, they have these discrete peaks that correspond to um, the first energy transition. So in a bulk semiconductor, you ex expect an absorption onset and then it'll keep going. But here, you're just absorbing into the first state and then there's a drop because there's no more absorption. And then it starts absorbing to the second state, and so on and so forth. So you could tune the band gap. Effectively, this first absorption peak is the band gap of the material. And then it can also luminesce. So these materials have excellent luminescence properties. This is the lead sulfide system. It's not that exciting because it's in the infrared. But if you have cadmium selenide, you can get all these different colors. So it's a, it's a highly tunable system. It can be made from solution. And it turns out that the absorption is extremely high in the infrared. Uh, so it's, it's useful. It's much higher than silicon uh, by orders of magnitude. So it's useful for making photovoltaics. So what does a quantum dot look up close? It's basically a, a core, a nanocrystal core. So in this case, I've shown a lead sulfide a nanocrystal. And these little dark uh, circles are the lead atoms and the, and the yellow is the sulfur. And the, the quantum dot, it, it exists in a solution. Uh, and the way to do that is by stabilizing it with these ligands on the surface of the nanoparticle. So it does not agglomerate. If you try to remove these ligands, there's a good chance that they will try to agglomerate with one another. And then you don't have a colloid anymore. There, there are ways to stabilize these things in nonpolar solvents as well. So typically, we process these things in, um, in octane, which is a nonpolar solvent. So CQDs is abbreviation colloidal quantum dots. And like I said, these materials uh, can, are lightweight because you, you need less material to absorb a uh, similar amount of sunlight compared to something like silicon. Um, they can be put on flexible substrates. And there's groups that work on this. And they've shown that if you flex the substrate, uh, you retain the properties of the material. And there's solution process, which means you can do roll-to-roll -roll processing. You can put them on curved su sub surfaces and tunable. And the tunability is key towards designing different kinds of optoelectronic devices and, um, and also controlling the optical properties for, say, something like lighting. So a little bit more about how these materials are processed into inks. So if you want to make a solar cell, for example, you have a, some sort of substrate, an electrode here. You put a quantum dot droplet on it in solution. You spin coat it, and you make a thin film like this. And in some applications, you can stop here because you, you know, maybe it's a down converter, an energy down converter. But if you want to make a solar cell, you want to make these films conductive. But in the, in the state they are, so the center circle is the quantum dot, and there's a ligand shell surrounding it. In the present state of the materials, they're sort of, they don't talk to each other electronically because they're far apart from each other. And that's how, that's how you get these things to talk electronically to each other. You have to bring them close together to get uh, this wave function overlap of the carriers to happen. And the way to do that is right in solid state, we come in with another molecule, a shorter ligand, and we cross, and we remove the, the long ligands and we generate this tightly packed film. It still has some ligands on the surface, but they're much smaller, so there's electric, electrical communication between uh, in the array. So then, okay, we understand what colloidal quantum dots are. We understand how to process them into films. What can you make with colloidal quantum dots? Well, it turns out people have been making really interesting things. So this is what's called a device stack. And here you have uh, two electrodes and in between them, you put all sorts of uh, charge transport layers uh, such that you can allow recombination to ha occur in the quantum dot layer. Um, so, the, so the key here is that um, the electrons and holes will be shuttled through these electrons. Uh, so the electrodes and then the electron hole pair would recombine here to give you this color. You can make displays. So here there's a, a picture of a butterfly and some flowers. 
you can do uh, lasers. So this is a SEM of not quantum dots, but a very closely related system. And these are these sort of platelets. Uh, and, they, and they allow for amplified spontaneous emission. Uh, and then you can, people have actually used these to make continuous uh, wave lasers. And they're solution processes, so they're very cheap compared to what is, what is typically done with bulk semiconductors. You can make photodetectors uh, with quantum dots. So quantum dots are exceptionally good at absorbing uh, light, as I said. So here in one scheme, it was actually quite clever. It's a photoconductive photodetector. Basically, you take a, a, a sheet of graphene and you put it between two, uh, two electrodes, a source and drain. And then you put quantum dots on top of the graphene. And the quantum dot absorbs the radiation, and you generate an electron hole pair. The, one of the carriers will be trapped inside of the quantum dot, while the other one will transfer to the graphene, and it will zip around the graphene and, and produce gain. So for every photon absor uh, absorbed, for the duration that the, one of the carriers remain trapped in the quantum dot, the other carrier can cycle around. And this is the nature of the photo detection that occurs in these kind of devices. Um, and finally, where the bulk of this talk will be about is photovoltaics. And how do we make device stacks that um, uh, enable us to capture the sun's energy, so absorb as much of it as possible, and then extract those carriers? So here I've shown a typical device stack, and I'll talk more about this later, and the current voltage curve. Uh, and, and the efficiencies we're getting nowadays is around in the 9 to 10 percent range, actually. So let's talk a little bit about the physics of a solar cell so you can sort of understand the later points of, of the engineering approaches we've taken uh, with the things we've been doing in our work. So you again have this picture of the, of the semiconductor, the valence band, and the, in the conduction band you have the electron sitting in the valence band. And if you know semiconductors, you'll know what a, a Fermi level is, but I won't get too into, too into detail about it quite, quite now. So upon absorption of a photon, this electron gets promoted to the conduction band. That's the simple picture. And the absence, absence of an electron is a, is a hole. Just think about it as in terms of an air bubble inside of a glass of water. That is sort of the analogy for a hole um, inside of this uh, valence band. And so you call that an exciton. And remember, I talked about exitons when we were, lo were thinking about confinement. And so in the device, you generate many of these carriers. And so you want to extract them. So a solar cell should be able to make use of this el energy that you've taken. You've taken optical energy, and you've converted it to electrical energy. And you want to make use of that. So you need to shuttle these carriers to a side of the device where they can do something useful. And to that end, we make a PN junction. So this is a you know, basic concept you learn in the semiconductor physics course. You have an n-type material that is rich in electrons. So you, can, you can dope the material in a way that you generate electrons in the material. And you have a p-type semiconductor. You put them together, and, and, and you make what's called a PN junction. In this PN junction, you have a built-in field. There's a built-in electric field, and this is the band diagram. And this built-in field is critical especially in quantum dot devices, for shuttling carriers to different sides of the device and generating a voltage. So the initial process, so this is the band diagram spatially. So you have the, um, it's kind of a flip version of this. So you generate the electron hole pair. The electrons, they want to go downhill. The holes, they want to go uphill in energy in this case. And they get shuttled to different sides of the device where they get extracted. And so at the same time, if you accumulate electrons and hole pairs um, on these sides of the devices, they lead to, a, to, what, to what's called a quasi-Fermi level splitting, and that generates a voltage. So there's a way to generate current and voltage in this kind of scheme, and you know um, that you know, voltage times current is power. And the equivalent circuit representation for this device is a current source, and it's in parallel with the diode. And then there's a resistance is, uh, in parallel to this configuration, as well as a series resistance. So what does a solar cell actually look like? You have a back contact. You have the semiconductor layer, which is typically 
a pin junction. There's also been work on Trotsky junctions, if you're familiar with those. And then you have a front contact. So you have to sort of complete the loop, and then the sunlight just uh, shines in here. So this is a chart you could look at for a long time. And it summarizes the best research cell efficiencies in the field. And you can see here that the best cells, they're actually, they're multi-junction cells, typically gallium arsenide. This is the stuff they send out to space uh, with satellites. Um, but the stuff you put on your roof is in blue here. It's these uh, silicon solar cells. The modules, I believe they're in the 20% or 15 to 20% range. And you, want, and, you, and you know, recently there's been a lot of noise about perovskites. They're really heating up the photovoltaic scene because they've already hit 20%. So, so if you look at the x-axis, this is year here, and this is the efficiency. And, and look how quickly they've reached 20%. So it's exciting. And then you have quantum dots, and they're kind of in this corner right here. Uh, so you might be wondering, well, you know, perovskites are so much better. Why, why are you working quantum dots? But the reality is, is that these materials are not often stable. So you can see here this yellow designation, perovskite solar cell, not stabilized. So there's still a lot of work in understanding how stable these solar cells actually are. We know they're efficient, that's fine, but are they stable enough to actually make it to market one day? So that's an ongoing uh, research topic. We have to, you know, you have to be cautious because you read a lot of literature and um, you get what is called uh, USOs which are unidentified solar cell objects. And what is important in the field is to publish certified results, especially when claiming a new record, uh, because that kind of guides the field and it provides um, verification that, that all the labs are kind of publishing comparable results that are comparable to each other, because there's different schemes of measuring solar cells. And this would be quite useful in other fields as well, if there's standardization methods for measuring performance. So a little bit more about efficiency, so you can understand where we are today and where we want to go. So here a shot of, I've shown a plot of what's called the shockley quizer limit. And um, you have the, the max efficiency on the y-axis and the band gap on the x-axis, and this, in turn, this sort of controls the maximum efficiency that you can get. And it's around, the, the optimal band gap is around, is, is around 1.3 AV or so. <clears throat> so you're, like, if you wanted to pick a, a very high band gap material, you would get a huge voltage in your device, but the problem is you wouldn't be collecting very many photons, because a, a lot of the photons would just pass through the material, they would never get absorbed. At the same time, if you made your band gap too small so you could absorb everything, the absorption process um, eventually carries, you're going to have the initial excitation, but then the carriers will relax down to the bend edges. They will relax down to the conduction and valence bend edge, and you lose that energy as heat. So you have to sort of optimize in between these two regimes. So the way we build the quantum dot solar cells is we take glass, and, and then on top of it, we put a transparent conductive oxide like uh, ITO. And then on top of that, we put a wide band gap anti semiconductor like TiO2. And then our quantum dots, the way we process them, they actually end up being lightly P-type. So this forms the heart of the P-N junction. And then in the back, you can put a deep work function metal uh, as an ohmic contact. And that kind of completes the device stack. So you have two uh, electrical electrodes to complete, complete the circuit. If you look, if you go into the lab and you measure a solar cell, you, you sort of apply a voltage in the forward, if you, you know, you shouldn't be familiar with forward biasing a diode. And it's the same concept. Just here, the current kind of goes the other way and you end up generating power. So when you apply enough voltage such that the forward diffuse current offsets the, the solar cell current, the, the photo current, you get uh, a case with zero current flowing, that's called the open circuit voltage. And at zero voltage, you're sort of collecting as much current as possible. It's called the, the, uh, the JSC, the short circuit condition, and somewhere in between where you have both voltage and current, so you know you're generating power, uh, you have the maximum power point. So these are some simulations 
uh, that I typically do on these solar cells to figure out where we go next in terms of efficiency. So here are the different regimes. This is the short circuit regime. This is the open circuit regime. Uh, sorry, this is the maximum power point regime. And this is the uh, open circuit regime. And these are band diagrams. So this is the lead sulfide. This is the TiO2. So you can simulate the band structure and you can play around with what parameters affect the performance. And here's a standard cell I used to simulate when I was doing my PhD work and here we had 7.6% uh, efficiency and you can see these metrics correspond to what you would find on this, on this curve. So what are the challenges? What were the big challenges in quantum dots and quantum dot photovoltaics? So these materials that have a lot of surface, so they're highly surface sensitive and there are trap states that can form on the surface and these trap states they will annihilate carriers. That's one scenario through recombination. Or the other scenario is they will um, prevent, prevent carriers from being mobile uh, because they will momentarily trap the carrier and then it will have to get re-emitted to keep going. They require some form of separation. So this kind of imposes a, a limit on the density of the film. And sometimes, depending on the chemistry you want to have on the surface, it can impose limits on the mobility because the particles are farther apart from each other. They don't talk to each other as much. And they're, they're, the picture of doping is more complicated than, say, silicon, for example. So we had to find new ways of electronically doping the materials so we could have both p-type and n-type films. And we found the ligand coverage affects stoichiometry, and I'll talk about that in detail. The other thing is, now if we look at these materials electronically as an array instead of a single quantum dot, they're messy. So there's disorder, traps, inhomogeneous band gap distribution, because you don't truly get one type of nanocrystal uh, in solution. You get a sort of a, a broad distribution. And then if you look at the energy associated with these materials, you notice that there's all these states. Ideally, you'd want to have just one sharp line for your conduction band. But you have all these different states that can momentarily trap carriers or annihilate them completely. And actually, mobility and lifetimes are not great in these materials. They're less than 0.1 centimeter square per volt second in, in, the, in the best PV films. And lifetimes are on the order of 100 nanoseconds, which is, uh, f given the mobility, it's not great because it'll limit the diffusion length. So how do we improve quantum dot efficiency? The one way to do it is come up with new architectures for these uh, devices, and that's going to require moving the Fermi level around or, the, uh, or, or making the films n-type by creating more electrons or making them p-type by creating more holes. So you control over majority carrier polarity and density. The other thing is you want to have control over transport, and you want to get electrons to move faster, and you want to get them to survive for longer and same for holes and these the traps that I'm referring to are actually states within the band gap that allow this energetic couple the electron and the hole to relax and you lose that energy so you can't harness it in a photovoltaic device so the type of work we've been doing is the analysis of mobility lifetime trap density and diffusion length which is critical for solar cells uh, in order to understand and improve these materials so let's look a little bit at the quantum dot surface and the kind of games we can play with the surface to achieve this. So this is the lead sulfide uh, quantum dot. And I, can, I told you, you could rip away the long ligands and you can put other things on the surface. You can also have anion substitutions and cation substitutions, interstitials, and different types of ligands. So this is an L-type ligand. It has a certain binding motif. X-type ligands make covalent uh, bonds. And so... This kind of dictates what the electronic properties will be of the final nanocrystal and of the final film. So how does doping work in silicon? Most of you have seen something like this. You basically, if you have silicon and it has valence electrons, there's four on each silicon atom. You can substitute a phosphorus, for, in this case, for one of them, and you get an extra electron. Or you can substitute a boron, you get a hole. An absence of an electron is a hole. Um, so this will give you n-type and p-type materials so you can build your p-n junction. How does it work in quantum dots? So this was something we looked at first. We looked at it empirically and we thought in bulk uh, lead sulfide 
not in a nanocrystal form, but just if you have a piece of lead sulfide, you can actually cause, using halogens, you can substitute out the sulfur, and this would give you uh, n-type character. So we tried to do the same thing. The other thing we did is try to avoid oxygen, because oxygen will quickly convert your material to something that is p-type. And so we managed to do this, and the way, the way we did is we took this quantum, this architecture for a field effect device, and we put the quantum dots um, between the source and drain electrons, and then we uh, electrodes, and then we applied a gate bias to study uh, the modulation. We treated the quantum dot film with these halogens, these halogen ligands, and we found out that we could generate n-type films by avoiding oxygen. We worked in a glove box, and by treating the films. With, uh, with these uh, special ligands. So then once we had uh, this film, we, we asked the question, like, how can this be expanded upon, or where did doping come from in quantum dots? And it turns out in quantum dots, it just comes down to stoichiometry. If you're cation rich, you end up with an n-type material. If you're, if you're anion rich, you end up with a p-type material. And you can sort of sum up over all the oxidation states uh, as a very simple picture. And then you can predict the type of doping you will have. So here, this is density functional theory done by one of my colleagues. And it calculates the number of excess electrons based on a certain stoichiometry of the quantum dot. So basically, you can get free holes and uh, free electrons and free holes uh, depending on how you tailor uh, the quantum dot itself. So as I mentioned before, why would you want to do this? You want to have control over carrier polarity and density. You can build P, uh, PN type architectures or something that they've done in amorphous silicon. You can build PIN devices. And these have benefits in terms of charge generation and charge extraction. So we expanded this framework further. And instead of working with just uh, a certain halogens, we worked with all sorts of different materials under different conditions. Um, and we got doping densities in both n-type and p-type uh, of 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 18 uh, per centimeter cubed. And these are just field effect curves uh, showing that you can form, uh, in this case, say, an n-type channel. So you apply a, um, you apply a positive uh, gate bias to your to your, sorry, it's here. So you apply a positive gate bias, and then the electrons get sucked up into the region uh, at the dielectric, and then you can generate this uh, n-type uh, channel. We verified that the chemistry of the, of the films with uh, Rutherford backscattering, and we sort of summed up over the, the negative and positive contributions to the, of the oxidation states of the atoms we had. And we, we noticed that the, this theory that we came up with sort of confirmed the type of material we expected, whether it was p-type or n-type. So yeah, so we had the theory of doping. We could have control over the materials. But there was the still pressing question of um, what do we do with them? And so what we did with them is we employed, we employed them in photovoltaics. We took out the bulk TiO2 semiconductor. Uh, that we usually use. So this is the band diagram. This is the material here. And we substituted an n-type quantum dot layer. So we used quantum dots for the entire device, except for the, except for the metals that make up the electrodes. <laughs> and this gave us improved performance. Our best cells were 6% at the time. So this was a while ago. Uh, and this was a record at the time. And because you're not limited uh, by this bulk electrode anymore, you can, tu you can freely tune the band gap of the p-type material and knowing that you can also tune the band gap of the n-type material. So now you, could, you have a truly scalable system uh, for making uh, p-n junction of any band gap that you want. And we noticed that when we went down to very low band gaps, about 0.7 eV, this architecture failed. It did not produce anything uh, meaningful. But this one still gave us a nice looking uh, IV curve. So we took it a little bit further. I'm not going to get into the details of this too much, but we engineered what's called graded doping uh, portions of the device. So we put, so we, we, all, we changed the grading. For example, here we had a p-type layer. 
and then we had a lightly doped anti-player, and then we had an even more highly doped anti-player at the back. And these graded uh, layers allowed us to have improved voltage, both voltage and current in the device. So here is just a, a capacitance uh, sweep showing that we were able to track the depletion region within the device and sort of explain this phenomena as we were um, making these type of structure. So that was a bit on the doping in colloidal quantum dots, making new materials and making new devices, but there's still a much bigger issue and that's the quantum dot film, uh, the electronic landscape and these traps that are present in it. And the best way to think about a colloidal quantum dot film is sort of like this wavy, energetically wavy uh, road uh, because you don't just have one type of quantum dot, you have slightly different sizes. So you end up having an energy variation in your, in your bands. But because you have surface defects potentially, because you don't have that much control over these materials, you end up having these mid-gap trap states. So things can recombine and get annihilated. And the best way to explain transport in quantum dot films is actually with lemmings. So this was a game a long time ago where you had to get these little guys from one side of the level and get extracted in another part of the level. And you can think of these little guys as electrons that you need to save. So you generate, you photogenerate electrons and you get, have to get these guys out. But a trap state can represent exactly the scenario where now you lose some of your carriers and your the device doesn't work as well because you can't extract them. So this is, this is sort of what we targeted next. So how do we probe transport in colloidal quantum dot films? So when I joined the group uh, in Toronto, we were worried about the fact that we didn't have just one type of nanocrystal, but we had a distribution. And if you, take a, if you put the absorbance spectra of the quantum dots in solution on the logarithmic scale, you see that you can model this distribution with uh, a Gaussian, so it's not exactly a peak, and you have some sort of inhomogeneous component that corresponds to uh, different sizes. So those mean, that means different band gaps. So this is the kind of film we want with one, with one size quantum dot, very sharp band edges. But in reality, what you get is um, something where this energy landscape will vary because you have quantum dots of a different size. So we wanted to force this, and we added uh, small band gap quantum dots into this matrix. So you'd have a very rough energy landscape, sort of we induced a much rougher energy landscape. So this is the conduction and valence band picture of this. And so a pristine film will maybe have like one small dot occasionally. But a, a film where we intentionally introduce um, small band gap quantum dots, it would have these holes that, that these, in this case, electrons will fall into. And then they have a high probability of recombining with something in the valence band. So why did we do this? We did this to sort of see where things were relaxing. And to study this, we uh, employed these uh, photo photoluminescence measurements. So what you do is you make a film of the stuff, you illuminate it with light, and then you observe the light that's coming back out. And so here what I've shown in the x-axis is wavelength, photoluminescence on the y-axis. and when the charge, when the electron hole recombines in the film, it emits a photon and you can detect it. So in this case, we had a 0% treated film and a 0% in solution, so they have different intensities, but it's just to show where the line for the, for the main film is. And then this other line is if things recombine in these small band gap quantum dots. And it turned out that just when you just add 1% of the uh, small band gap quantum dots, so these guys, just 1%, everything was coming from them. So we thought it could be a potential disaster if we had an inhomogeneous broadening in our film. But then we said the only way to test that is if we make devices. So we made devices and we concentrated on voltage. So if you put these intentional traps into the material, you expect to get a lower voltage because they will destroy your carriers. And we found that the device didn't really care how much of this stuff you mixed in. So up to 10%, you know, it, it retained its open circuit voltage and the other parameters were almost the same. The efficiency didn't really change that much. 
it's also, it's only when we met, went past that it, it really started degrading. So we thought, okay, well, what's, what's going on? So we did, so we did some simulations. Uh, and this is sort of a loaded uh, plot, but I'll explain what it is. We, we envisioned that there must be some sort of trap state that is sucking away all the carriers and causing problems. So the trap states, both trap states and this broadening in the distribution of the quantum dots was, was creating problems. And we thought trap states were, were a much bigger problem. So on the, on the y-axis is the trap state depth. So the trap state depth controls the recombination as well. The x-axis is the population distribution. And um, these different plots correspond to different concentrations of traps, where in this case, there's no trap. So in the no trap case, you can clearly see that you have high efficiency when you have low distrib uh, distribution or, or very narrow distribution. And then as you increase the distribution, your efficiency drops. But in the case where you have a lot of traps and they're kind of deep, um, you sort of go across here and you see that your distribution doesn't really matter. And so that's what we thought was happening here. We don't need to fix the distribution of the quantum dots. We need to fix the trap state density. So then we thought about, okay, well, what can the trap state density be affecting? So we, we need to look at the transport regimes in our devices. So this is, again, the band diagram of the quantum dots in the TI2 interface. So the x-axis is the distance and y is the energy. And when you, when you don't put voltage on the structure, there's a, there's a lot of depletion in the let sulfide layer. There's a big electric field here, or relatively big. And if you generate electron hole pairs, they can get extracted because in the, there's electric field helping them. So we thought maybe in this region, traps would not be as big an issue. But then when you forward bias the, devi forward bias the device, so you have some voltage and you have a current and you have power, you end up with this region that doesn't have an electric field. And that's a result of this, you know, uh, electronic condition. And so here, the trap states could uh, recombine your carriers. And this, was a th this would cause for you to have a lower diffusion length. So the diffusion length is sort of a measure of how far a, a carrier can go if it's generated in a film. And so if it recombined here, it would have a, a low diffusion length. And then, obviously, would not be able to get extracted. So this, um, so we again employed this photoluminescence study. And again, I just want to reiterate this, this process of photolumination, uh, ph photoluminescence. You excite carriers uh, from the valence to the conduction band. They relax down to the bend edges and they recombine and they give off a photon and we can detect it. Uh, so the, in the film, the charges will migrate until they get stuck in something, either a trap or a smaller band gap quantum dot and then recombine them. And if it's a luminescent recombination, we can track it. So let's look at these transport regimes under the conditions of these quantum dot films. We have, in one case, we have the quantum dots here. This is the population we want in brown, and this in the yellow, these are our traps. In the low coupling regime, because the mobility is low, you don't expect the carriers to go very far. So your, your diffusion length shouldn't be too affected. But in the high coupling regime, uh, your mobility goes up, but eventually you'll be bottlenecked by the distance to the nearest trap. So that's what we thought was happening. We were getting bottlenecked by these traps. So, so I came up with these two um, measurement schemes for measuring diffusion length in quantum dots. This is something that's not been done. And it's quite easy with these schemes because it's optical. And so what we do, in one case, we excite this portion of the, of the film the excitation then migrates across the film. And at the edge, we put a smaller band gap quantum dot. So again, we use the same concept that things will like to funnel down to the lowest energy uh, locations and recombine there. So we can track the luminescence. In the second complementary method, we interspersed the smaller band gap materials within this matrix. And we sort of looked at, at the interplay between where things were recombining. So in this case, as we increased the film thickness of this main layer and kept this layer the same, we sort of, as, we, as you would expect, observed re, uh, reduced luminescence from this final layer. And we could fit that. We could fit the intensity of these peaks, and we could extract the diffusion length. In this case, we were able to actually come up with a full model that enabled us to extract mobility, trap density, and diffusion length. And we could really, in detail, study 
uh, what was going on with the carriers in the film. So here you sort of see the interplay between the recombination and these uh, brown centers, which are our main population, and these smaller bang up quantum dots. And that is exactly what we did, but we needed to, a test platform. And so this talk is about optimizing the surface passivation. So our standard approach at the time was just to put these thiols uh, with a carboxyl group at the other end on the surface. And now we, did, we added in this uh, you know, added effect of putting uh, chlorine on the surface. And we use a cadmium chloride salt uh, to achieve this. And so what ended up happening is we were able to look at all these parameters and compare the two different passivation schemes. And what we found was, for example, for mobility, you don't really get a big change in mobility when you improve the passivation. Um, for, for trap density, you saw that there's a lot of traps in the organic crossing. This is the left one case, but there's not very many traps in the hybrid case because it also includes these other halogens. And the diffusion length improved uh, from, from the organic crossing to the hybrid uh, case as well. And so we saw a big jump in device efficiency when we made devices. We went from about 4% uh, on average to about 7% uh, at the time. Um, and then in sort of a, a final piece that I did uh, during my PhD, we, did, we further improved on this passivation method and we, we started in solution rather than in film. We sort of added these little thiol molecules but instead of having carboxyl on the other end, we had a halogen on the other end, and that ended up having beneficial implications with the trap density. Then when you did the solid state treatment, you would remove these other ligands, and your nanocrystal would just be decorated with different types of, hal uh, of thiols with different f f other functional end groups. And the efficiency uh, improved greatly. So for example, this is the as-synthesized lead sulfide. This is the lead sulfide with the chlorothiols uh, after they've been exchanged. This is lead sulfide with the cadmium chloride. And then when you combine these two together, uh, you get the highest efficiency, and that was the 8.5 that we measured. So the conclusions from the work related to the quantum dots is that the doping allowed us to design new architectures for high efficiency devices, but that's not enough. You can't just rely on building new architecture. You have to realize high quality materials with either care, uh, and especially with high diffusion length. So then I modeled sort of the diffusion length versus device thickness. And you want to make thicker devices so you can absorb more light, but that can have detrimental implications for the increased resistance in the device. So you would have to keep improving the diffusion length and the device thickness at the same time. So you can go from this place where we are today, around 8, 9%, some cases higher than that to about 15, and it, it can just come from improvements to the diffusion lengths in the materials. Some other avenues that we explored, we made these nanopillars in order to get around this diffusion bottlenecks. So this is a top view of the nanopillars, this is a side view, and we put the quantum dots in between the nanopillars in our device, and this just reduces the distance that electrons have to get, to travel to get extracted at the pillar, and then we could simulate this 2D structure and look at the electric field around these nanopillars and what associated benefits are. Similarly, you can make graded structures, so you can use the fact that the quantum dots are tunable and you can grade uh, the band gap and you can make a funnel for one carrier without affecting the other one too much. You can make a downhill funnel for the electron to help it get extracted, so we compared these different motifs of grading and we found that this downhill funnel is best. And also, this is a group at MIT, I, I worked there as well now with these guys, uh, they've made this sort of configuration where you sort of, uh, you create this downhill funnel but also it helps block uh, carriers from going to the wrong contact, so they get shuttled towards the wrong contact. And so uh, finally, what are some exciting frontiers for quantum dots? There's been a lot of noise in uh, a lot of good journals about singlet fission, so this is combining organic materials with inorganic quantum dots, and um, you can take one photon, uh, you can generate an electron hole pair with it, and instead of extracting just that one pair, you can generate two electron hole pairs from that single pair, and that's called uh, singlet fission. And they needed to, to con transfer this excitation from their organic material to quantum dots, uh, because of the superior electronic structure in quantum dots. So now they can harvest 
more than one electron hole pair from a single photon. This stuff is used in biomedical imaging, so this is just uh, the uh, uh, arteries of a rat. They lit up, they lit them up with uh, quantum dots they added. Uh, so you could image, you could attach these quantum dots to a drug or, or to, to something you're trying to image and see how, it's effect, how effective it is in biomedical imaging. And also you could use quantum dots in a Z scheme in uh, photocatalysis. And the fact, so this, for example, is a, such a scheme. You have these two pain junctions here, uh, or just two header junctions, and you use quantum, different types of quantum dots uh, to cause the reduction in oxidation processes. And the benefit to this is that you can actually move these energy levels around as well as tune the band gap to, to the desired value. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank the, so I'm actually from the Sargent Group where all this wor work was done at the University of Toronto, had a lot of funding from NSERC. Uh, but now I work uh, at MIT, at the Grossman Group, we're working on similar things as well as other energy materials. And if you're interested, you could always uh, shoot me an email if you see room for collaboration as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you again for uh, listening to my presentation and having me here. Thank you very much, uh, David. We have some time for questions. Yep. So, as you said, the stat states are the major problem right. for increasing mobility of uh, quantum dot field. And if we decrease the surface defects, how much we can increase the uh, mobility? And is it enough to compete with the nowadays uh, Yeah, sure. So, so the trap states, you know, depending on their depth, they affect mobility. So if they're shallow trap states, if they're close to the band edges, they affect mobility. If they're deep, they affect the lifetime. So there's two things here. So we think that the shallow trap states are not as much of a problem as the deep trap states. There's been reports uh, where if, if you remove the shallow trap states, you can expect mobilities in the tens of centimeters square per volt second, but that's nowhere near enough to compete with you know, highly crystalline bulk semiconductors. So the, the advantage to getting rid of trap states is in increasing the lifetime. And you can go about an order of magnitude in that, in that direction. And that could have, uh, and that will mostly improve your diffusion length. Yes. Uh, so the, so the IV measurements, all you really need is, uh, is two probes to contact um, the two sides, the two terminals of your device. I don't know that there is a standard way to, to do that particular measurement. What is, what is standardized in the field is uh, you have to measure the area of your device very carefully. Uh, because uh, you know you have to you have to divide by the area when, uh, uh, to get the current density, and you have to calibrate the solar spectrum. So your solar spectrum has to adhere to certain standards, and those are the two big things that people uh, worry about. As far as actually making the connections to the device and taking the IV measurement, um, you can pick a, a slow scan rate just to make sure that uh, you're getting the correct value of the current at each point. But other than that, there's not too much standardization there. Uh, sorry? It should be very slow, right? it, yeah, it's preferable. Yeah, it's preferable if it is slower. That is usually, that means it's reliable. Uh, because some of these materials, especially perovskites, depending on how fast you sweep them, they will give you a different response. And uh, as well, some materials change under sweeping too. That's another problem in itself. But yeah, a slow sweep, I would say, would be recommended for the IV sweep. Yeah. <laughs> he was at my PhD defense, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you know where my question is probably going. And um, so Dimitri Talapin, of course, hooks up the little quantum dots with other things. Yeah, yeah. And I can't really remember exactly, but they were sort of used like tin chloride. 
Yeah. Yep. So I guess my general question is, is there room for um, innovation with hooking up these dots with other things in the Yes. Is this a way of controlling the ligands? Is, is it, or is it just cause more problems and more trapped states? Yeah, so the 100%, that is a huge research area in the field. Um, choosing the right kind of ligand or choosing the way that you're going to bring these nanocrystals uh, close yeah. together. So what Dimitri did, he was, um, he had huge mobilities and people got very excited about the way he put these quantum dots together. But when they went to make solar cell films, which, which also include the, the lifetime part, they found that they couldn't make good devices and it's, they think, and I've talked to some of the members of his group, they think it's because of the recombination. And these, these ligands, which are, they're called MCCs, they're not the best in terms of that aspect. Um, some people grow shells on top of the quantum dots and then they get rid of ligands altogether and they fuse the shell so the core is still intact and then the shell. Some people are thinking about completely getting rid of the ligands and just fusing the nanocrystals together just a little bit. And then... He, they're more like complex. I don't know if it's a nanocrystal. I thought it was a, a complex. Yeah, so maybe I'm not thinking about the, the right paper. So the short story is that doesn't work very well. Um, I think the best efficiency they got is about 6%. Now that they've kind of optimized it a bit more, but the best cells in the field are around 9. So it, it hasn't worked better than the best approach, which still, which uses actually the halogen ligands. Uh, and potentially swapping out some of the of the sulfur in the lead sulfide system. So do they permeate within the quantum dot, or are they just on the surface? They might. They we looked at it, and it looks like they might permeate within the first layer or so, but they don't. They don't go deep. And so, how are they solving the problem of the trap states? Uh, so the. So the ligands, depending on th how they're incorporated, they can either dope, so one, that's what I showed in one case. So if there's a lead atom and there's a dangling bond, if the halogen is small enough, like in the case of chlorine, they can get in there and passivate that dangling bond, where there are another molecule, like a big organic molecule or some other conventional one that we use, wouldn't be able to get in there. So that's one way. So you're assuming that most of the trap states are on the surface now? Yes, the yes. Bond. Most of the trap states are on the surface. For sure. So it's all about surface modification. Yeah. And that's why the chlorophyll chlorophyll seem to work well. The chlorophylls, uh, yeah, they, it's the thiol that binds to the surface, and then the chlorine we think might be close enough to the surface to interact with it in a beneficial way to, to move the energy levels of the trap. So that's a little bit more, there's a little bit more details there. It, the, the chlorine we, it may not necessarily be bound to the surface when it's on the, on the actual ligand. Yeah. So I guess the question is, I think you're looking at, you're sort of aiming at 15 percent of these quantum dot structures, um, and you're not there yet. No. Is it possible to get to 30 percent with, with these materials? Yeah, if you, theoretically speaking? theoretically speaking, yes, there's nothing stopping you from, if you're able to get one nanocrystal size, clean band gap, no other energy losses, there was there would be no reason. Uh, uh, why you wouldn't be able to do that, but realistically, uh, I, don't, I don't see that being possible with, with the way th people are looking at it, because there's still some energy losses. There's this concept of a Stoke shift where there, there's an inherent energy loss that we have to figure out where it's coming from, even from the core, not even thinking about the surface. So theoretically, yes, but practically, it might be the same thing as with organic solar cells, where they sort of think that their upper limit uh, after all, practical considerations is in the 15% range as well. I think that's where it might be uh, Yeah. And if you just have a single size quantum dot, you're also restricting the energy over which you can pick up light effectively because you're only, you're only getting, you're only targeting that specific band gap. Yeah, that's true. So ideally, we'd want to have one single quantum dot in an ensemble. So if you might. Another ensemble. Yeah, and then you make another ensemble of a different size, and then you can make multiple junctions, and then you can boost the efficiency that way. I'm sorry to take all the questions, but how well can you control that size distribution? Are we talking, like, what, are the, what is it really like, practically speaking? 
So the, the band gap varies about at least 0.1 EV uh, within a distribution. So it's, it's not insubstantial, but another point, another, that, that represents another 0.1 volt on your VOC that you could get. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be pretty substantial. And so are there efforts focused on trying to control that even better? Yes, and there, so the slides I showed with the different quantum dot peaks, uh, that was a recent paper also from MIT where they narrowed the distribution down. But then people started asking, well, in the absorption spectra, and if that's where you're studying it, uh, what, is the ideal, what is the ideal line width? Because TEM imaging studies, it can also be done, I guess. You can, you can look at an array of quantum dot and look at the, and look at the size, but it's not perfect. So there's another question there, like how good can we get? And people don't necessarily know the answer to that question because it's a matter of imaging to this, this line with. Yeah. Yes. So in, um, it, it really depends on the quantum dot film. I mean, you're looking at um, a, f a fret process uh, when you have excitons. In the quantum dot films for PV, shortly after the excitation in a coupled film, the carriers dissociate because the binding energy is not all that high. And then you have a hopping mechanism across these energy states. Uh, so that would be the mechanisms in those two coupling regimes. The diffusion lengths in quantum dots are in the order of about 100 nanometers or slightly less. And th this has been confirmed by other groups at this point, And that's what we measured uh, as well. Does that answer? That was more the charge carrier diffusion length, I would say. Yeah, because we, we didn't do it on low coupled films. So that experiment was on a highly coupled films. And you sort of, you sort of assume the materials have enough, p t their p-types, they have enough carriers for a combination to occur in that small band gap layer at the edge. Right. Right, so the, well, the changing the size changes the band gap, obviously. If you're talking about changing the morphology, that could have implications for mobility because you're starting to space things out a different distance apart. So uh, the doping, um, that will change the depletion region uh, if you, within your PN junction. So all these little tweaks can tune, but different parts of the device or, or, you have to, or, or enables you to make new devices, like I've shown with a graded doping scheme or the PN junction made entirely out of quantum dots. Sure. In the conventional world, you mentioned that the absorption of the light depends on the thickness of your uh, material also. So it seems that the material and thickness is also in, uh, important. Right. Uh, and also the band gap is important. So in quantum dots, how the material and the size is related to the absorption? not only because it makes the different band gaps. Right, so the, so the band gap, the way you want to optimize it, you just want to pick it at the right value. Uh, and it's, it's in that range between 1.1 and 1.6. 1.3 is, is a good one for quantum dots. Uh, the thickness, you want to have it thick enough to absorb as much light as possible. But if you keep making it thicker because of the low mobilities, you end up running into more into resistance problems. And so uh, you can, 
I wouldn't tune the band gap so much as try to improve the materials properties to, uh, to make the devices thicker. There are some, there's another approach where you can play games with the solar spectrum. You can look at the solar spectrum and you can say, okay, maybe I don't want my band gap to be uh, 1.3 uh, V because I'm not absorbing everything anyway. So maybe if I shift my band gap a little bit and I realize that my device can only be X nanometers thick, maybe I can still win. But we did those simulations and it ended up being that, you know, you still want to stick with this 1.3 uh, band gap based on the shock likewise for limit. Are these, uh, are these materials air and uh, water stable or do you have to, uh, will you ultimately have to encapsulate or package them? Yeah, so the, so for a long time these materials were not, they would perform the best under nitrogen so you wouldn't even be able to run them in high efficiency under air. Moisture will degrade them over time. The newest architectures we have now are actually quite stable, both operating and being stored in air. So they've, the MIT group, uh, they've shown that you can keep them in air, store them in air and for half a year, and you can still get the same efficiency. So that's, that's pretty encouraging, so they're not that sensitive anymore. But you're going to have to get up to, uh, you know, five or ten years. Ten years, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So we still have a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Any other questions? If not, uh, please join me. Uh, sorry, do you have another question? Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am. Join me and thank you, Dave, for a very fine presentation. All right. Thank you.